Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Dake. I am the Curator of Education here at the Denos Museum Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening for our virtual, I guess you can call it opening reception, although the exhibition has been open for a while, uh, for our show uh, about Matthias J. Alton, uh, which is being hosted uh, and was organized by Grand Valley State University. Uh, so this evening we have a brief gallery walkthrough for you, and then we'll have a presentation uh, by curator uh, Joel Zwart, who is joining us. And uh, then we'll follow that with some conversation. So I'll have some questions at the ready. Uh, and if you all feel free to uh, get in the chat or the Q&A uh, and uh, ask some questions throughout the program, and I'll be sure to try to circle back to those as we can uh, when it makes sense. Um, I want to uh, thank Joel for being here and he'll tell you a little bit about uh, his role in the exhibition here in a little bit. Uh, and then of course we have our executive director, Craig Hadley, uh, who is actually located in the museum. And uh, we'll be having him uh, give you a tour of the galleries. So if you haven't seen it, this will be your first chance uh, to take a look around uh, and then uh, we'll hand it over to Joel. So I don't know, I see Craig's uh, logo there. I wanna see if, there he is, he's got video now. All right. Great. Can can you uh, can you spotlight me, Jason? I, I can only yep. see your shared screen. And yep. I'll, no problem. Uh, I'm, I'll stop sharing here and then. Perfect. Uh, uh, there we go. Good to go. I couldn't tell whether my camera was pointing forward or back. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. My name is Craig Hadley. I'm the director here, like Jason said, and happy to be with you uh, on this evening just to, to show you around both the Alton exhibition and uh, then we'll have some time for conversation with Joel. Um, just a few things. I, I know for those of you who have been here, we do typically ask you to wear masks, of course, inside the museum. We're closed right now again, um, but I'm the only one in the building, so I will uh, unmask for the presentation. So I'm going to flip my camera around here uh, just so you can get a sense of the exhibition. I'm going to adjust my camera here. Uh, but, you know, we actually did an, an event similar to this last week actually with GBSU and some of their audiences um, and you know I think folks really enjoyed getting a chance to see the exhibition I think I'm Joel and Jason if it makes sense do you want me to just do a quick loop around the gallery and um, do you want me to stop along the way or if the two yeah, of you that, want to comment yeah. on anything yeah, if we just do, let's do a walk around the gallery and, and if um, Joel or I wanna you know, point something out, we'll, uh, we'll speak up. Wonderful, okay. Well, I'm gonna get us started here. This is the, the entryway to our gallery. We've got a self-portrait by an older Alton here. Um, as you sort of swing around this way, I'm gonna pan this wall here. Uh, Joel has the exhibition laid out uh, by these different subsections. And so the exhibition really focuses on, um, you know, all of the technical change and industrial change in Alton's world um, as he's working and painting in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'll stop here just for a brief moment. Uh, what's really unique about this exhibition and what Joel was able to do was uh, really incorporate ephemera documents, other artifacts from Alton's life uh, into the exhibition. Uh, and so we see um, different certificates and papers from uh, Alton's younger uh, adulthood. And we also see um, photos of Alton as a young man uh, when he was married. Um, Alton immigrated, and I, I probably won't get into too much of this because again, Joel will probably have a presentation here for us. But I do just want to sort of point out a few things along the way. Uh, of course, pretty prolific uh, in terms of, of landscape painting at the time, as was pretty common for many uh, Midwestern artists. Uh, and Craig, do you want to do you want to stop at that one for again for a quick second? Sure. Yeah. Happy we, to do that. We talked about this one before. I think this is actually kind of a really unique piece. It's, it's funny to think, so this is a study piece. It's uh, essentially a panel painting, a small panel painting um, with four different studies in it that was completed in Europe. Um, and so it, it's interesting to think of something like this 
Alton probably would have kept this, uh, you know, in his studio as something that he referenced. And uh, it's so it's a wonderful thing, just sort of seeing that the way that an artist uh, is framing sort of small scenes and and uses that uh, in process, perhaps later on to create a, a larger work of art. Um, but it is interesting to think of us too, uh, taking an object like this and framing it and putting it in a gallery, because I think for an artist, uh, this would they they would consider this to be a study piece, uh, not sort of gallery worthy. Absolutely. I, I think he probably would get a good laugh out of seeing that <laughs> in the gallery. But uh, it's we talked about this last week and it really is, um, you know, it's really a fantastic piece an opportunity to see uh, Alton experimenting and trying some new things out, um, thinking about maybe what might be next for for some of his work. Uh, next door, we also have our Michigan modern exhibit on display right now. Uh, so it's a a Michigan themed fall. Hopefully, uh, if and when we reopen, folks will get to come back in and see see these two shows together. The exhibition also features, like I said, several other um, you know, ephemera and artifacts from the special collections that those are at GVSU, correct, uh, Joel? Yeah, those are from the, the special collections and, um, and archives at the university. Mm -hmm. So part of the display as well is um, Alton's palette and, and brushes. And so these were particularly nice additions when we were able to lay the exhibit out just because we had some three-dimensional work to sort of incorporate into the, the layout, the installation. Alton spent quite, spent quite a bit of his time, of course, uh, abroad. He went back and forth uh, between Europe and the United States uh, during his lifetime. And so his work certainly reflects um, you know, his travel and his time spent abroad, both painting landscape, pastoral scene, um, and coastal scapes as well, seascapes. Exhibit features a number of uh, sketches as well, which probably don't, you know, probably don't translate that well on, on Zoom. Uh, but I assure you in person, they, they really are pretty spectacular to get a chance to, again, see the artist practice uh, thinking about what might be for a, a potential painting or a completed work. I'm trying to remember exactly, Joel, how many pieces there are in this exhibit. Do you there remember are, the, the I count? Think there are 46 or 47 works of art. Uh, that doesn't okay. include any of the ephemera or objects. So you can see again with Alton's time, particularly uh, painting in, in Spain along the coast, uh, pretty uh, common theme in his work. I'll, I'll mention that in the talk, but that is a, that's an incredibly uh, common scene for him that he, see, he seeks out in, in, in very different climates. So um, he's, he did, seeks that, that sort of scene out in the Netherlands uh, he does so in Spain and he does so on a number of different occasions as well in the United States. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that idea of um, the traditional landscape and, and, and nostalgia in particular as it relates to labor, agrarian labor, as well as um, this, these scenes of fishermen here in Spain, they're sardine fishermen up in uh, the Netherlands, it was herring fishermen. Um, but right, to get to that, the earlier point you mentioned, just the idea that the world was moving on at a very rapid pace and, uh, and Alton really favored those nostalgic scenes. Yeah, so Alton is, uh, you know, taking us, rendering scenes for us that, that might be a little more, um, that might be a little more fanciful <laughs> perhaps than they really were. Um, but again, you know, life and time is changing so rapidly. Uh, and in addition to that, he's competing with new processes at this time, right? So he's also competing with the camera and with new 
processes, technological advances in art making and in doc arts that um, didn't exist prior. We, uh, we stopped and talked about this last week, but um, again, just sort of um, echoing some of the, the sort of themes uh, familiar to us, particularly up here in Traverse City. Um, and so again, this, this particular work does not have a label. And I think that's because this one came up later, Joel, but um, do you know the title of this one offhand? Yeah, and that's in actually my uh, presentation. I'll talk a little bit about it. It's called Gulls of Leland. Okay. And uh, so this, this one is uh, not far away from your location there. This right. is later in his life, uh, in the mid 1930s, he traveled up and spent some time in Fishtown and, and, and painted a number of scenes around there. Um, this one has a, a almost a wonderful musical quality to it in that you, the, there's a cloud of gulls surrounding the fisherman who has uh, presumably just dumped his bucket of, uh, of leftover fish in the water. And um, it, as you get close to the painting, it's hard, to, it's hard to tell sort of the gulls themselves, but as you back away from it, it's got one of those sort of wonderful moments where there's this cloud of, uh, cloud of seagulls and you can just imagine the noise what it, that's occurring. Absolutely, he's he's really sort of a master of recreating that environment and, and the feel of, of really being there. And so you do get a sense of that sort of chaotic movement <laughs> in that particular piece. And so this sort of brings us back around uh, to where we started. And of course, Alton, uh, like so many artists at the time, um, also earn their living by painting portraits. And so portraiture is sort of a, a, a large part of their livelihood and um, what they need to do to make a living uh, and to fund some of the other types of works that they would um, like to, to be painting or experimenting with uh, and certainly his time abroad. Yeah, that painting right there is one of the uh, Michigan Supreme Court justices. Uh, and so Alton, right, I mean, uh, part of his bread and butter we're, we're painting uh, portraits, um, and I can I can talk a little bit about this in the presentation. But um, the lumber industry, of course, in Michigan, um, presented him with many opportunities to to paint uh, lumber barons and their families, um, as well as other members of high society. So that takes us back to the. Uh, entrance to the gallery. If there's anything in particular that you'd like me to focus on, I'm happy to steer the camera that way. Not sure how close you can get to those two things in the case, but um, I could mention a little oh, bit about yep. both of those. Um, again, these are some of the, the, the objects that have traveled with it. And uh, there are two gold medals, um, one of which is from earlier in his career when he was studying in Europe. Uh, and another is um, probably more when he's sort of hitting a stride as a professional artist. Uh, and it's from uh, the Scarab Club in, uh, in Detroit, um, which is a wonderful uh, arts organization right next to the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh, and, and I think you can, if you look closely on the left-hand side, you can sort of see the Scarab Beetle there uh, in the center of the medallion. So it's, we've really been um, blessed with having a lot of the objects uh, in our collection that the family has given. And so um, it's, it's, it's really nice to be able to present um, paintings, drawings, uh, watercolors alongside parts of his, uh, of his life uh, to give that full picture. Well, and again, we were so fortunate to, to be the first stop on your tour uh, as this travels the state. So uh, you'll have to remind me where this is headed next after, uh, after the Denos. Uh, it's going to Hillsdale College in the sort of the southeast side of the state after this. Uh, they actually own a number of Altons as well. Um, but yeah, we are, we are we're grateful, we're excited that uh, we were able to work with you uh, to have it at the Denos. And um, despite the fact that uh, uh, the situation that we're in that uh, we're still able to present it in, in, in different ways to, uh, to your audience and your community. So, Absolutely. We look forward to keep sharing it. Uh, we are making some plans and some changes um, with future venues, but we do have a few other places that it's going to across the state. Wonderful, thank you. All right, uh, and, and with that, we'll, we can kind of 
move into the presentation portion of the of the show. And uh, Joel has actually um, produced a presentation, a slide presentation. So it's just like if you were in the in the auditorium with us, uh, this is probably what we'd be doing. Um, and uh, we're really happy that Joel was able to make this available for uh, for us and for the public. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll hand it over to him and then uh, he can talk a little bit about Matthias Alton. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Craig. Let's get my screen up here. Well, yeah, it is. It's a uh, wonderful to be with you. Um, it's unfortunate I can't be with you in person. Uh, I know that's been said many times over the last a number of months. So um, uh, I was able to come up early to drop off something for the exhibition and sort of preliminarily see the space, and it's great. So we're really excited at Grand Valley to be able to share this exhibition and that the Dennis is the first stop. I guess this is one of those things where I, I'm sharing a photo of myself and you can see me as well. <laughs> so they're a little redundancy, but here I am. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll talk just briefly a little bit about what we do at Grand Valley State University. Um, so some of the reason why we're doing this exhibition, um, uh, why we have the Alton Collection. Uh, and as far as the focus for the art gallery at Grand Valley State University is really sharing artwork um, across the university campus uh, and through um, and through our digital holdings. We do that in every building that the university has. We have a small campus up in Traverse City and there's artwork in that building there as well. Um, and so our, our goal is to have artwork in every building. Uh, we also have six changing galleries. Uh, and we put our entire collection online. Um, and that is uh, a way for us to continue to make things available that are not on view. And uh, one of our largest collections is the, uh, the collection of Alton. It's the largest public known collection of his work. Uh, it was generously started by George and Barbara Gordon. Um, George Gordon had a business that took him around the state of Michigan and he uh, fell in love with the landscape. And that's one of the reasons why he started collecting Alton's work. Um, uh, although Alton traveled quite a bit, uh, the majority of his work really is a document in some ways of the state of Michigan. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the presentation later on. But um, uh, George was, uh, was really captivated by Alton's work, began collecting it. He and Barbara have collected it for years and we're grateful because they uh, ha have given us the opportunity to have the largest collection. And we've been able to add to that with ephemera uh, that the family has given us. And, other donors have added to the collection. Uh, the, uh, we usually have it on view in our George and Barbara Gordon gallery on campus. Um, and we, we do still have uh, some of it on view there while it's the rest is traveling around the state. Uh, but also due to the, the shutdown, um, we created an online virtual tour so you can see what the galleries look like if you like. We've also added the Matthias J. Alton catalog resume in the last year, which has been a great addition. So this is essentially a digital catalog of all the known work by Alton. It was um, uh, Jim Straw was a longtime um, catalog resume developer, researcher, uh, and uh, really championed the cause of Alton. And um, he passed away unfortunately this year uh, and we were able to acquire the catalog resume. And so uh, if you're looking for work by Alton, uh, you can usually find it in, in the catalog resume. If it's not in the catalog resume, um, we'd love to learn about it uh, so we can add it to it. So uh, why are we traveling around the state of Michigan with, with Alton? Uh, it, it's the celebration of 150th uh, uh, anniversary of his birth uh, in 2021. So that's in some ways we were charged uh, by our, co our committee that oversees the Alton collection in the George and Barbara Gordon gallery with, um, with doing something uh, to honor his legacy. Uh, there, was, um, there are a number of institutions I think that are, are, are doing that as well. The, the Grand Rapids Art Museum is doing something and I know the family is excited about this. So we really wanted to be able to share the collection around the state. Uh, and so that's um, why we, the exhibition is happening. Um, it's drawn from our collection uh, and we're working with our, our archives and special collections to add to it as you've seen in the tour already. So our goal really is to share this around the state, uh, make it more accessible and, um, and, and share the work that Alton did uh, and, and, and raise, the, um, raise the awareness for the great work he did and what an artist he was. So with that, I'll talk about the life um, of, of Matthias Alton uh, uh, and, and his career and 
uh, an extensive career that it was. One of the things I do want to touch on um, particular though is, um, and I'm, I've got this photograph of him. This is not in the exhibition. Um, this is another early photograph we have in the collection of him uh, taken by Thomas Frederick Noble, who was a photographer in Grand Rapids for many years. Um, this is about, um, I, I would say Alton is close to 20 years old here. And this is maybe a year or two after he immigrated from Germany. Uh, and I look at this photograph and I see a young dapper uh, young man, you know, in a suit uh, with his coiffed hair. Uh, and he has a look of optimism uh, in his face, I think. And, and he really represents, I think, what many of that generation who came over during the late uh, 1800s, early 20th century were looking for. And that was opportunity. Uh, so in some ways, he is, his story is a story of an immigrant um, who settled here, made his home in Michigan, um, continued to work in Michigan, uh, returned to Michigan. And, uh, and, and so I focused that uh, on that in the exhibition a little bit and with some of the text. The other thing, and we, one, of the earlier, one of the earlier thematic sections that I, I wanted to talk about too is the idea that uh, the world that Alton was born into, the world where um, he traveled across an ocean to another country, uh, even the art world was a, was a world in flux. There were many things that were happening there. Um, the results of the Industrial Revolution uh, were resulting in real uh, economic and urban growth. Uh, and as an immigrant, he joined this crush of people that were coming uh, to the United States. Michigan, of course, was also one of those states that benefited greatly from immigration and its population surged during this time. Uh, as well, Alton was coming to a place where lumber was, was changing uh, the way uh, that Michigan was. Over the 1800s, it became a much larger state, it became a state. Um, it also increased uh, uh, dramatically in terms of um, the money that was brought into it because of the lumber business as well as uh, the furniture business. And I've got uh, the civic flag of Grand Rapids here, Furniture City as they uh, self-proclaimed themselves, uh, which was a major part of West Michigan um, uh, economics uh, and, and still is today. So, and Alton is born in 1871 into what is at this, what we're sort of beginning to call Germany at that point. Um, and, and, he, and he immigrates in 1889 with some of his family. Uh, and so he's young, he's a teenager when he comes across. Uh, and so I think of that photograph in the previous slide of him uh, a year or two removed from immigrating uh, to his new country. He was an artist already in Germany. Uh, he was interested in art um, and created works himself and, and sold those works. He apprenticed uh, under an artist in Germany. We've got the certificate in the exhibition uh, from Joseph Klein. Uh, he learned uh, mural work uh, and painting and wallpapering. And he put that into action when he came uh, to Michigan. Uh, he married Bertha Schwind. Uh, in 1895, and the two of them operated her family store, soon underneath both of their names, uh, paint and wallpaper store on the west side of Grand Rapids for many years. Alton uh, started to, to seek out um, other teachers. Uh, he decorates furniture for the Phoenix Furniture Company. Uh, there's a postcard that I've included on this slide, which shows you uh, that, that furniture factory. And so he put his talents to use uh, in the furniture business, decorating furniture. But I think like most artists of the time, and Greg and I talked about this before too, it's a very common at that time for artists to become artists, it's very common for them to make the trip to Europe, uh, to go to Munich or go to Paris and to study to become an artist officially, uh, to get that proper training. And he does, uh, so not long after marrying, uh, he decides, uh, he applies for citizenship, so that's important. Uh, and in 1898, goes to Europe for training where he studies in Paris at the Academy Julien and the Academy Colossari, uh, which is where one of those medals is from. He also takes uh, evening sketch lessons um, with Whistler, Whistler uh, who many of you know, uh, and travels uh, like many artists do at the time to see the great works in the museums and see the sites and he travels throughout France and Italy, the Netherlands and Belgium. And I've included a watercolor, which is uh, in the exhibition, I believe, of, um, uh, of a street scene in Paris. So one of the things that's common of Alton's work in this early period is common of a lot of artists work when they're 
becoming artists when they're when they're learning their craft, and, and that is really controlling what your what your what your subject matter is, uh, and including fine detail. And I, I've included two works here. The one on the left uh, on my screen of the chrysanthemums is from uh, approximately 1900. So after he's returned back from his year long trip to Europe to study and to travel. Uh, and it's a still life, which is common of artists. It's, it, this is something that Alton does uh, quite a bit early in his career. And it's interesting because he stops creating still lifes uh, and then returns to them much later in his career, but they're very different. What's common of his still lifes in the early part of his career is that they're interior environments. Uh, they're lit particularly, they have dark shadows, they have heavy colors and they're highly detailed. Uh, and so you get this notion of creating an environment and creating something that a uh, subject matter that you're painting. Um, and so you'll see this with artists as they go through their training, they paint still lives and Alton does that uh, quite successfully. The one, the other image on this slide is of a bayou at North Park outside of Grand Rapids. And detail is clearly evident in this work, especially if you get up close to it, um, it's in the exhibition. Uh, and you can see how painstakingly he's painted every single reed around that, um, around that little pond, that lake there. Uh, and so the idea that you would paint every brush, every brush stroke would represent a reed. The idea that as an artist who's young and learning, you're replicating things directly a lot of times, um, replication, heavy detail. And so those are two common themes you find in his work very early on. I hinted at this earlier, but uh, uh, nostalgia, traditional labor and nostalgic scenes are, are some of the things that he returns to again and again. And this is in some ways an opposition of what's happening in the early 20th century. We're seeing electricity and the combustion image engine being applied to many things. Um, and that's not really what Alton paints. Um, we're seeing rapid urbanization and, and Alton is staying away from that. And it's not that other painters aren't, other artists are painting those things, but Alton sticks primarily uh, to the rural areas um, and to the traditional and nostalgic scenes. He really celebrates traditional labor. Um, and you see that particularly, I think in agrarian forms where he's out in the fields painting farmers. Um, and most of the time, very little do you see of any sort of technology that was applied to agrarian labor at that time. And that's happening uh, in Michigan. Michigan is, the farms in Michigan are exploding at this time in part because the lumber industry has taken down large sections of forest and there's more farmland that's becoming available. Um, but, but there's, at, at some point the scales turn and there are fewer far, there are less farmers and there's more farms because they're able to farm more efficiently with technology. And Alton's not painting that. The other thing I think that's really, um, a part of the reason behind, I think, of the way he paints is the impact of the First World War and the pandemic of 1918. And these are two things I think that are key. I, I can imagine him as a German American, this being a challenging time for him um, living in the States. Uh, and, I, and we have diaries from uh, one of his daughters, I think, which is interesting, which talks a little bit about that. Uh, but I, I know, as, so he doesn't travel. So this is a restricted period of time where he doesn't travel. And increasingly during this time, he paints more, more and more rural areas. There are less urban areas that are painted. Earlier in his career, he does paint urban areas, but less so as he goes on with age. And in particularly, because of that first world war and the pandemic where there's this restriction on movement, he's painting a lot of self-portraits. I've included one from 1917, <clears throat> excuse me, 1917 on the slide. Um, but he, he creates a whole set of self-portraits during this period of I wouldn't say self-imposed isolation, but this period of restriction that uh, comes about because of the first world war and the flu pandemic of 1918. So it's interesting to think of those things in particular um, in regards to what's happening right now. Um, so, so Alton, in some ways, I think um, there are these horrible things that are going on in Europe for the first world war. And um, I think in some regards, there is a desire for many of his patrons to look for the beautiful. And I think that's one of the reasons why Alton continues to paint these very nostalgic scenes that remind people of, uh, of another time. And some ways in many of their minds, a better time, right? Where technology has not been applied to so many things, including the killing of people. So here's a couple examples of traditional labor, both of which are in the exhibit. Um, 
the 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 painting of hauling the boulder i think is again a a beautiful work where sunlight is sort of breaking through the clouds there and you can see the breath of the horses uh it's a cool morning uh you can see it's a little moist because there's some tracks in, in the mud there and a farmer is leaning over to hitch up this boulder for his teams to pull uh and the other image is of workers in a field and you get this sense so neither of these scenes have uh, a lot of technology applied to them, and neither of these scenes have a lot of urgency to them too. And I think that's one thing that's very common with his work too. There's not this urgency um, associated with the work that's happening. Uh, it's very complacent. It's um, uh, the scenes are quite calm. Uh, the, in, in the scene of the workers in the field, uh, they're obviously they've stopped their work and they're sitting there and having a small conversation. Alton takes an, an extensive trip to the Netherlands in 1910. So this is his first trip outside the United States again after his trip in 1898 uh, to Europe. And he goes to the Netherlands, and he spends almost a year there. He paints interior scenes initially, and then he goes to the coast of Steveningen primarily, uh, where he paints the coastal villages there, um, in particular the herring industry, um, which is again, fine. He's seeking out a very traditional form of labor. Uh, the herring industry at that point, there was not a harbor there at Skaveningen, and so they used horses to draw the herring boats up onto the shore. Um, even though Skaveningen at this time, there was a large pier there, uh, it was a resort town. He did not paint that part of uh, Skaveningen, he painted the, the sort of the, the traditional laborers that were off to the side um, that, were, that were bringing in the herring boats, as you can see in this painting entitled Rescuing a Boat. One of the things that's, that influences uh, him there is the work of the Hague School. The Hague School is a group of artists, late 19th century, there's a second generation as well, Hague School, um, who are influenced by the Barbizon School in France. Um, to, I guess to, to put it plainly, the Hague School artists were very interested in mood. Um, and I mentioned this a little bit in some of the texts, including with the labels there, but they were preoccupied with the color gray. <laughs> but they were preoccupied, I think, in the ways in which gray is many different colors. And you see that play out in Alton's work. Alton brings up blues and greens and pinks in his gray. And he's mimicking a lot of the work that the Hague School did a generation before him, but which, is, which are available to him there to see in the museums. Um, a, a painting by uh, Henrik Mesdog, for example, would look very similar to this painting by Alton. And so he's painting scenes that are similar to the Hague School and he's applying lessons um, and techniques that they have done. And again, traditional labor, nostalgic settings. So that's a common theme. The other thing that I think is really important for artists, um, artists like Alton uh, in the early 20th century are artist colonies. Uh, these are places that uh, pop up around the United States. They are in support of plein air painting, outdoor painting. Uh, again, um, the idea that you are painting directly from nature. They, they fall in line with what I was discussing earlier, the idea that when an artist goes and travels to, the United, or to Europe to learn to be an artist, when they come back, what's the support system for them? Uh, and so these artist colonies, this, this time uh, of the early 20th century also is, is really a time when there, there is a flourishing of artist colonies across the United States. And so part of what they're doing is that they are supporting artists that are coming back stateside. Uh, they, are, they are supporting them with places to work outdoors, to paint plein air, uh, with these picturesque scenes, uh, a lot, and often very times sort of these uh, picturesque pastoral landscapes. Uh, here's a scene of a farmer in Oxen in Lyme, Connecticut. And I have a list here then of, of um, artist colony visits within the United States that he took. And you can see it's quite extensive. So early on it's Old Lyme, uh, later on it's out, out west and also um, east uh, in New England. Old Lyme in particular, I think is heavily influential with him. It coincides uh, with his early part of his career after he's back from Europe, he goes to Old Lyme in 1902. So I think that's important, right? So he seeks out other artists, a place to paint with people who are like-minded. At that point, Old Lyme is brand new in terms of an artist colony. Um, it's influenced by the Barbizon School from France. 
uh, so heavier, uh, heavier tonal work, tonalist work. By 1911 and 1913, when he returns, artists like Child Hassam are there, uh, and they are really influencing uh, the way that the artists there are looking at um, different work, and it's more influenced by Impressionism. And so Alton starts get, getting more of that, um, especially because he's gone there in 1911 and 1913. He goes to Taos in 1927. Uh, of course, that is also around the heyday of Taos being an, an artist colony, sort of growing up as being this place where people go to paint uh, Laguna Beach as well. Uh, and then Rockport, Massachusetts, Gloucester, Massachusetts um, in um, New England. And so his work takes on a very impressionistic quality and, uh, and, and falls in line with what many artists are doing at that time. So these are important things for him in his career. And that's reflected in the exhibition, it's reflected in his body of work. And then the other thing that's uh, probably most influential, influential for Alton is the Spanish artist um, Joaquin Sorolla. And Sorolla is sort of a, uh, he, he kind of he hits it big at the late 19th century, early 20th century. He becomes really well known in the United States in part because he's brought over to do a couple of major shows there and eventually to do work for the Hispanic Society of New York. Um, he has a couple of impressive and influential shows that were, were quite uh, clear that Alton saw his work at some point. Alton probably also saw his work in Paris when he was there in 1898. Um, and so one of the things about Soroya is he falls in line, I think, with some of the subject matter that Alton likes. Uh, it's a very different environment, but he goes there in 1912. And of course, you see that um, after 1912, he doesn't travel to artist colonies or to Spain, right? Because there's that World War I and the flu pandemic of 1918, um, which actually the flu pandemic of 1819 extends to 1918. Um, uh, 1919 and 1920 as well. So he doesn't travel again until 1922 when he goes back to Spain, but then he goes again in 1928. So Spain really is important for him. He goes to the exact same place where Soroya paints. He doesn't actually uh, meet Soroya. He'd love to meet him and I think he would have loved to have studied on her own, but they just never quite meet. Uh, but he goes to the exact same place along the Mediterranean coast to paint and paint scenes very similar to Soroya. Um, he does some interior work uh, and he does uh, some, uh, he does some paintings of, uh, of the, the local populace, but the majority of them are these uh, seaside scenes. Uh, in this case, it's oxen. Uh, it's not uh, horse teams as it was in the Netherlands, but it's the same style, right? These are uh, sardine fishermen, and this is an old traditional form of labor and way of bringing the boats in up on shore. Um, uh, and so very similar to the, to, to the Netherlands. The major difference, of course, is both the climate, uh, the time of year he goes. He goes there when it's incredibly warm. Uh, the climate is very different from the Netherlands. And so what happens, uh, and, I'll, and I can talk um, a little bit about this, but what happens is that his paintings change uh, dramatically. He comes back, of course, these are received incredibly well. Uh, they are, at that time, they would be termed sort of these exotic works, uh, but the, the people embrace them. They, he sells them incredibly well. Uh, they, they have a much brighter and airier feel to them. And part of that is the climate. And the other part is that he's also following Soroya and adding this sort of a more brighter touch to his palette, uh, a lighter touch to his work as well. And so I have two examples in this next slide of that. Uh, and he, so he applies that to his work here in Michigan. And I've included the, a painting. Uh, this is at, not in the show. This is a, a show that's still in the gallery back at Grand Valley, Sassafras and Sumac from 1925. Um, things are just in general brighter. He paints with less deep browns and dark colors in his paintings and paints with much brighter oranges and blues and greens. Uh, and that's not just work during the summer, that's work in the fall and the winter and the spring. And so it's, um, that's a major change in his work uh, due to his traveling to Spain and his uh, seeing of Soroy's work and emulating what Soroy is doing. The other uh, image here is of, in a private collection, but I want to include it because uh, it's a great um, comparison to the still life we looked at earlier. Uh, this is a still life uh, that he painted much later in his career and his life. Uh, and this, so he returns to still lifes in the 1930s. 
uh, and he paints them in a much different way than you saw earlier on. Uh, in some ways, it is a controlled environment, but it's less so controlled because it's on his windowsill, or there's other ones which are on his porch of his home, uh, where he is looking at the way that light is filtered through the glass or through a drape or through the blinds. Um, it's not an interior studio where he has a heavy control over how the light appears. How, does, uh, how do the stems break up uh, in the water, in the glass at the bottom of the vase? And so again, um, this work is a, is a much more impressionistic work and it's less controlled. And so you see this later on in his career, he returns to still lifes. And again, the work is much brighter too compared to the chrysanthemums that we looked at earlier. And keeping with the theme of Michigan, um, so I think we're, we're incredibly grateful that he is an artist who returned to Michigan. Uh, the draw for so many of these artists to these places, these artist colonies in the center of the art world was great. And there are many artists who started their careers in Michigan and did not end them. And Alton is one of the few that um, has an incredible collection of work over a long period of time and started his career in Michigan and ended it here, um, who raised his family here, who made uh, Grand Rapids, uh, the state of Michigan, his home. And in some ways, uh, um, it's wonderful to be able to have that work because it's, it's of our home, it's of our state. Uh, his, his work is in some ways a love letter to the state of Michigan. Uh, and so I included two here, the one of the Gulls of Leland, uh, from 1936, which is much later in his career. Again, we talked a little bit about that um, in the tour of the gallery. Um, this is uh, right at the piers there uh, leading into Fishtown. And um, it's a very, again, it exemplifies the way that he's implying noise and movement with these birds uh, around the fishermen. The work, uh, the other work there picked at Makatawa, which is just outside of Holland, Michigan, along the dunes there, is much earlier in his career. It's 1904. Uh, and this is his family. It's a wonderful autobiographical account, sort of, of uh, recreation and leisure, which was uh, another thing that was becoming available to people at that time. Uh, we don't often think of that, but uh, right, the idea that you would go out for a picnic, that you would have a weekend that you would have time away to do things uh, with your family for the, the middle and the lower, the working classes. This was becoming more common at that time. So it's a wonderful um, picture of society at that time. And it's a great uh, look also of how Impressionism was starting to influence them. As we see this sort of family setting, uh, we see sort of the movement of the children kind of skipping uh, in the foreground of the composition. And we also see the way that he's uh, looking at how light gets filtered through trees. So even in his career, he's doing that. He's looking at the way that light is getting filtered through the different trees through the, uh, on the other side of the dunes. Um, but again, as a note, the, the darker palette is more evident in this 1904 work. If you were to look at paintings later in his career, it would be lighter. So uh, just a couple of notes on that. Uh, he paints in the 1930s primarily within the state, so his travels get limited uh, increasingly as he gets older. Um, and he dies in 1938, just shortly after he paints this last self-portrait. So uh, like still life, he returns to uh, portraiture late in life. Um, much of his earlier self-portraiture is in the, the teens, as I mentioned before. Uh, in part, he gets on uh, this kick where he paints quite a few during World War I and the flu pandemic. Uh, and then later in life, he paints a number of them. But this one, of course, is a wonderful one where he's sort of staring confidently at, um, at the viewer there, and he's showing you his palette. We saw one of his palettes in the exhibit here, but you see his palette and his brushes, and uh, it looks like a very more informal style self-portrait, which is really nice. Many of his earlier works, the one I showed you earlier in the presentation was one of him outdoors. And again, that one was a little um, uncommon. Many, many of his works of still of self portraits rather are inside and they're very simple and he's uh, dressed appropriately in a jacket uh, and confidently staring at the uh, at the viewer. Here he's got his jacket off right and uh, he's sort of sizing up his canvas and in the midst of painting. And so it's a great document uh, of the um, a, a year before he passes away. Um, and I'll, I'll start to wrap up there so we have a little bit of time for questions. I don't want to keep going on too much longer. Uh, but he has an extensive career, it's over 40 years. Uh, the catalog resonate documents over 2000 work, known works. 
Uh, we believe there to be well over 3,000 works um, in his career. So he's a very prolific artist, one of the more well-known um, Michigan artists. Uh, and, and I guess I'm going to return to the idea that I was talking about at the beginning, that he was someone who made this his home. He was an immigrant and was part of that enormous wave of people who came here looking for opportunity. Uh, and he found it. Um, and he settled here and he stayed here. And I think that's one of the wonderful things and tributes to him. And one of the things that I'm, I'm glad to be able to share with you about this artist. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. I just wanted to thank um, a few a few of our groups, um, we have, we've been really privileged to have endowments and friends of Alton. Um, if you're, if you're a friend, if you're not a friend of Alton, you want to become one, you're, <laughs> you're welcome to join. But we have, um, we have uh, many people who contribute in particular, the George and Barbara are, are special because they started this, but we have other people too, Anita Gilio, who is a granddaughter of Alton, who helped provide the endowment for the catalog resume. We continue to, um, to, to promote Alton and do the work of him. And it's much of that is done through these endowments. And that's a, a great thing that we have to be able to continue to do that. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. And um, if there's any questions or if there's any places in the gallery you wanna to go to, um, I'm happy to do that and talk more. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, that was, it's a great kind of uh, summary of some of the themes of both Alton's life and the exhibition uh, that I, I hope uh, folks are able to uh, come see in person sometime soon. Um, I did want to briefly just mention, you know, logistically, we, we've been fairly quiet in the chat. So if folks aren't familiar, uh, on your screen, you sh if you're on an iPad or something like that, you can touch your video screen and you should see a little bubble that says chat. Uh, you, you should also see something that says Q&A. Uh, and it, either one of those are fine. I'll be keeping an eye on those. And if you have questions you'd like to ask Joel uh, about uh, Matthias Alton or about GVSU, feel free to uh, throw those out there. I have a few questions myself kind of prepared. So people have some time to, to do some thinking. Uh, and I kind of break this down as I was thinking about it and typing in some extra notes from your, your talk. Um, kind of a few questions about Alton, try to get him, get to know him a little bit better. Uh, and then a few questions just about, you know, your role in the exhibition and that kind of thing. So, um, but I wanted to start kind of back where you started and looking at, um, you know, how uh, Alton, you know, he barely painted, you know, technology or, or advancement during his time. Uh, and I think in the, in one of the websites uh, that you, you folk, you guys produced, um, you know, omitting things to preserve the sort of scenic nature of, of what he was looking at. And I, and I think that legacy really leads directly to a lot of the artists that are working in the Traverse City region and the Grand Traverse region today, where there's this sort of sense of preserving the natural state uh, and, and not showing a human footprint or, or a human mark on the natural state of things, focusing on the aesthetic qualities. Um, and, and locally, I think there, over years, there have obviously been, some of it has been about environmentalism, very, very overtly about that, about let, let's preserve this, let's not let it um, become tainted. Um, but sometimes it's not necessarily overt, it's just a, a beautiful scene of nature that, that people are able to uh, take home with them and hang on their wall. And I wonder if you, you know, in your research or in reading some of these, uh, you know, documents, do you get a sense of Alton being anything like an environmentalist or, or you know, would he be one today? Um, or was it really more about that sort of traditional perspective kind of uh, uh, generally sort of against some sort of modernization? You know, was he weary of it? You know, I'm just curious about your thoughts. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I So I don't have anything that I've seen that directly relates to sort of him being an environmentalist. And I wonder that, um, you know, because he was taking, he would take the electric inner urban uh, from Grand Rapids, right? There was a streetcar system in Grand Rapids for many years. And um, in a lot of uh, communities around the United States, uh, there were inner urbans. And that really, it was, it's interesting, right? Because the dichotomy of that technology allowing him to get out to the rural areas and yet he'd get to the end of that stop. And he wouldn't turn around and paint, you know, the inner urban or the stop or anything like that. He'd walk off to a field and he'd paint the field. Um, he had a studio in downtown Grand Rapids for many years, and he didn't paint uh, Grand Rapids. Um, you know, even traveling up to Traverse City and going up to Leland, like he didn't paint the communities. He painted um, 
the rural area. So I think those are very conscious choices. Um, and I think a lot of that is driven by choice. A lot of, uh, a lot of that's also dr driven by um, economics. I think the work sold well. And I think that's one of the reasons why. So I, I, I don't want to forego the fact that he was a, a good businessman because he was an artist and he, he supported his family that way. It was incredibly hard to do. Um, and he didn't, he taught, but for the most part, he was primarily an artist. And so I think some of that has to do with your audience, the fact that you're selling work um, and you're responding to that market. And I think the other part of it is also that I think that those are things that he came to enjoy and came to be really good at. Um, so I think to your early, to, to get to the point, I guess, I would, I would imagine he'd be in favor of, of keeping these uh, rural areas, keeping rural areas um, intact, allowing there to be um, ways in which technology does not encroach on the environment and allows us to preserve sort of some of these areas which are, which are natural, yeah. Yeah, so I guess a follow up to that is, you know, in terms of his his main collectors or, or collectors that were purchasing more than just one work offhand, you know, were they primarily based in Grand Rapids in the city proper? A lot of his collection is, is so yeah, I would say Grand Rapids was big, but he also sold work um, uh, through a number of galleries in New York, as well as in um, later in his career, he had some successful shows that were out in California. And actually, if you track some of the auction records for Alton's work, um, they show up in California and on the East Coast, as well as down in Florida. Uh, he did spend some time down in Florida. He painted in Tarpon Springs, as well as Hollywood Beach. Um, but he, uh, so he sold work in those places as well. And so I think while Grand Rapids, well, Michigan was his primary source of, um, of an audience to purchase his work. Uh, he had work in major galleries in, on both coasts and sold work there as well. So I think he filled a niche there. He also was, uh, so to get back to the lumber industry, he was also brought out um, to different places. There was a lumber, um, a lumberman's family who moved with the lumber industry to Oregon. Uh, and he made a trip to Oregon in part because he was brought out to paint that family there uh, because of the connection he made in Michigan. Uh, and so went out and spent some time in Oregon. So uh, I think he made a lot of the connections in Michigan. Uh, later in his career, was very aggressive though, or more aggressive, I would say, in having his work sold in some of the major markets in New York and in California. Sure. I was just thinking, you know, um, if you're living in a city and you're, you're buying art, you know, at that time, you're probably buying art that is of scenes outside the city, right? Um, yeah. Cities cities tend to have a habit of not being a very pleasant place to live. Uh, and so finding some way of bringing nature into your home makes a lot of sense in terms of an art market. Yeah, and it would in Grand Rapids at that time, which was um, which had a lot of factories, right? So there are uh, many factories in Grand Rapids at that time that are not as nearly as clean as, as we imagine that they are now. So um, the other part of it, I was I was curious, and you may you may not have a sense of this, but I wondered about um, Alton's interests outside of painting. I mean, it seems like that really took up the majority of his time and effort and energy. But mm -hmm. was was he someone who was interested in music or theater or had other hobbies outside of this? I mean, we, we think of some of these famous artists that you know connected their their art with jazz or or with classical music and you know those kinds of things. So I was just curious, looking at his collection of work, you know, were there things outside in the outside world that kind of influenced that? Well, his art, uh, his art expanded to other things uh, in terms of visual art. Um, we, so when he was, he was younger, he decorated the Ratzkeller, which is this traditional sort of German uh, pub that was, was created. Uh, pub's probably not a great word for it. <laughs> but uh, the Ratzkeller in, in Grand Rapids that was created for that German community, he decorated. Uh, he in their third home in Grand Rapids, he carved the, the mantle for, a fire, for the fireplace. It's still there and it's quite beautiful. He also uh, created um, a stained glass windows for his home, which are now in the collection of the Grand Rapids Art Museum, uh, very much in the style of Tiffany. So his talents extended beyond that. I know that his interest from some of the other works that he created that were sort of ancillary, that were things more for his home. Uh, he was an artistic person who I think applied those things to other parts of his life. I don't know so much about music. I think there's uh, there's a great, 
one of the things I think that's kind of interesting is that um, his daughter kept a diary for uh, that we have, and it talks a little bit about an automobile. They bought an automobile, I think it was in 1917 or so. And um, his daughter became a better driver than he was. He, he was also prone to leave the car in parts of the city and then take the streetcar home. And then the police would come to the house and let him know that his car with you know, that Mr. Alton, your vehicle is, you know, in another part of the city. So uh, he strikes me as being, um, I don't know, maybe a little absent-minded, but also sort of like a, you know, a, a, someone who enjoys life. <laughs> Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine er, in the early days of the automobile, he can't be the only person who was doing that on a no. regular basis. I think that, especially, you know, considering you could just run out of gas in the middle of nowhere, and what are you going to do? You're going to take a, take a different transit home. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll get to those here uh, shortly. I wanted to um, go back to that, uh, the collecting side of things. Do we know um, how many of his paintings were sold overseas uh, and, and, and actually remain in collections there, whether they're public collections or private collections? And then I, I thought that also give you a chance to talk a little bit about the catalog resume. Good question. I don't... I don't think I have a great answer for the number of works that are overseas. Um, so he painted over, he painted, uh, um, there are a few works in the catalog resident you can look up and you can find, he painted in North Africa, he painted in, uh, in Italy. There's a, a few of them that are there. So I, I, I imagine some of the work, particularly when he was in the Netherlands for nearly a year, I would not be surprised if he did not sell some of his work there. So I don't know right now off the top of my head if we have any records directly relating to work that never came back with him. Um, I would suspect that there is some there. In terms of auctions though, when auctions are happening in the United States um, or from auction houses in the United States, most of the work is coming from collections within the United States. So I don't, um, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure how much of it stayed overseas. Um, but the, I mean, the catalog resume for me is, it's just a wonderful way. So we've added a, new, a couple of new features. We continue to do so, but there's a couple of filters on there that I really like to be able to use, which you can sort by a geography. You can, a lot of times you can sort um, uh, by year and by subject matter. And so that like when I was talking about still life, for example, I mean, that's one of the things that I really enjoy being able to take, um, look at an artist, a great spectrum of the artist's work. If we're looking at 2000 works, that's a pretty good subject sample of the artist's work. And to be able to then to sort that and look at the still lifes, you get a pretty good idea of what he was painting in terms of still lifes. And you can sort that out and you can see the changes that he does. So for research, I mean, it's a curator's dream to be able to have this for an artist. And so I think in some ways, um, this is great. This is a really great resource that we have and um, we're really committed to continuing to develop it. So thanks for, uh, thanks for that softball. Yeah, and I did put it in the, in the, li the link in the chat. Uh, so if folks are interested, it's alt alton.gvsuartgallery.org. Uh, and it really is, it's one of those websites as a museum person, I'm jealous and I can't wait to maybe have something like that for our Inuit art collection someday. Yeah, really I'll, I'm gonna quickly do another pitch and that is, so you, um, I don't know if, if any of the people there are familiar with Armand Marazan. He's another artist who is um, more well-known in West Michigan and around Grand Rapids and uh, was probably a generation after, um, after Alton. He passed away in 2010. Um, he also painted for a long period of time and we've just acquired the catalog resume for that. We'll be adding that to our our website shortly. And so uh, I think that's one of our goals at Grand Valley is to really be supportive of regional artists um, that we have access to, uh, to add uh, catalog resumes if we can, because that really enables anyone to do research for it, right? Um, it, it makes it a very, um, doesn't privilege anyone for researching over anyone else. Everyone has access to it uh, and allows sure. everyone that opportunity. Yeah, and we do have, we had a Marazon show not too long ago, and we've, we've been in touch with um, his family about acquiring a couple of uh, works as well. So we're, we're excited to share in that uh, regionalism kind of uh, effort. So that's great. Yeah, I just picked up two new uh, Marazon paintings last Friday. So Joel, I'll have to send you uh, photos and information so you can update your catalog. Wonderful. 
Uh, and I wanted to get to the questions in the chat. So, and they actually are the perfect segue. It's like they knew what my next questions were going to be about. Um, and I'll, I'll read them both together because I think they are related. Uh, um, Barbara is asking, were his portraits mostly of Michigan residents? Uh, and uh, were they Michigan residents in Grand Rapids or primarily outside of Grand Rapids? <clears throat> and Sherry wanted to know who the judge was in the, the that whose portrait was painted in the exhibit. Um, he he painted a lot of Grand Rapids uh, residents. Um, as I referenced earlier, he painted many of the lumber barons, and the lumber barons uh, obviously were were people who um, were a lot of times transitory, right? They followed the the resources. So many of them, as I referenced. The one in particular, um, the, the Hawk family, they were in Michigan for a number of years and then moved out to Oregon uh, because that's where the, the resources were. And so he, he painted them in Oregon actually, uh, but met them here in Michigan. So I would say he painted a lot of the, the people involved in the lumber industry who, um, who were in different communities around Michigan. He painted a lot of the, um, the well-to-do in Grand Rapids. Uh, he painted, has a, we have a number of portraits that we know of, including one that we just received the other um, last year of soldiers from the First World War. Uh, the painting that we have is of a, a, a um, it was of a soldier who had passed in the war. It was a posthumous painted, uh, painting of, um, based on a photograph that the family had sent to him. Uh, so there were paintings um, related to that. Uh, and then uh, he would paint sort of sets uh, as he was commissioned to do them. So the Michigan Supreme Court justices, for example, I believe he painted all of those um, for, for the Supreme Court. The, the one in the exhibition is Walter Harper North, I believe. Uh, and if you look in the catalog resume, there's actually a couple that he painted of it. It's, uh, uh, I was talking to Jim Straub, I believe about this uh, before. And um, uh, I, I think, the first painting that he had done for him, the judge was not happy with, so he painted a second one. So I think there's actually two different paintings of that same judge. Now, um, some of the work I believe is um, is in the state capitol, um, yeah, but there are, yeah, there are there are paintings from Grand Rapids, and then there are paintings from outside of Grand Rapids throughout the state. I, I would say he did not paint a lot of individuals outside of the state of Michigan, unless he had met them through the state with the example of the lumberman who took him out to Oregon. Sure. <clears throat> um, and, and staying on that uh, subject of portraits uh, for, the, for the next portion here, um, Alton obviously covered a lot of ground in terms of different genre and subject matter. Um, but I, I wondered about the portraits. There, there are a couple of self-portraits and then there are several portraits of other people that are in the exhibition. And this is obviously a small portion of the portraits that he did over his career. And I was just curious if you personally have one that's in the exhibition um, that you you think is a favorite or you think kind of best captures his um, his ability to paint the the figure or or express something about you know who the sitter was yeah so I included two of the, uh, the of the self portraits that we have in our collection sort of the more non-traditional ones uh, the one that's painted later in his life is a great document and it's a very sort of impromptu image of him at the end of his career which I really uh, enjoy um, Many of the earlier ones that I referenced in my talk earlier are, 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 are works that are very formal. Uh, he looks um, pretty much the same in a lot of those images. And so that's part of the reason why I picked those two. Of the portraits in particular, I'm gonna actually, you know what? Um, well, let me see if I can't quickly pull up the catalog resume and... The wonders of technology. I know, can you see that? <laughs> yep. So just at a quick glance on the screen, you can say there's a there is a there is a formula to a lot of his self portraits, uh, as you can see on the right hand column here: self portrait with cigar, self portrait, self portrait, self portrait. <laughs> uh, 
it's uh it's him in his jacket and he's uh sort of quarter turned uh and looking um at the viewer and so you can see 1913 1921 1911 1917 1921 1917 a lot of them are from that period um and so those ones in some ways are very formulaic um, so I was glad that um, we have a couple in our collection that are more unique. The, the self-portrait uh, over here at 66 from 1937. The family still owns the 1935 portrait right here, which is another beautiful self-portrait of him uh, in a blue shirt um, and a yellow tie shown with another palette on his lap. And that's what I, one of the things I really like about these more informal self-portraits where you can sort of see him working. Um, and you can see sort of see later in his life, he painted a lot out of his home studio and you can see the, the window at the back with the blinds. Uh, and you can imagine painting still lifes, uh, fl floral arrangements on his front porch or in his studio with the light kind of filtering through. So in terms of self portraits, those two that I included in the exhibition are some of my favorites. I'm a little biased because they're in our collection, but they are not as prescribed as some of the ones that he painted of himself kind of over and over again, which are very straightforward. I would say, um, in terms of the, the, the portraiture in the exhibition, one of my favorites is of his daughter. And it's the, uh, it's the one where she is, she looks, uh, she looks the part of a, of a, of a young woman in the 1920s. Uh, she has this great dress on. Um, uh, so you, you kind of have this idea of the Roaring Twenties and the flappers, and she just sort of looks like a confident young woman. And, I, and one of the things that we talked about on that label is just the idea in that section too, that women's rights were really coming of age uh, um, when we were going to school where they were gaining the right to vote. And so the 1920s was this period of confidence, I think, for women as they were um, also entering the workplace. And uh, I, I love that portrait of her. I just think it's a, it's, a, it's a confident young woman. It's much different than some of the earlier portraits that he painted of his daughter, uh, which are much more um, uh, sort of these sort of, um, cute and um, sort of intimate scenes of a, of a, of a family member, um, maybe outside next to some flowers. Uh, if you see some of those paintings on the catalog resume of his daughters, they have much more of this sort of whimsical quality to them. Um, the Dutch would call it moi, sort of this very nice quality to it. Uh, whereas the painting in the exhibition of his daughter, she's a young woman who is very confident and looks all the part of the 1920s. Sure. Yeah, I mean, those, those later portraits, self-portraits almost have a, a Norman Rockwell kind of quality to them. I, I have to imagine he was aware of Rockwell uh, at some point, but uh, yeah. yeah, kind of illustrative. Um, I wanted to go, we're gonna go back a little bit in time. So uh, Lynn had a question and asked if you could describe his work at the Phoenix Furniture Factory. Try to say that five times fast as well. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, furniture, uh, I won't try and get uh, belabor uh, furniture history too much. And I, um, there are others who can do it much better than I can. But um, so Grand Rapids really made its mark with furniture that was um, mass manufactured uh, of, of revivals. So they, there was a period there in the late 1900s, early 20th century, uh, where all the rage were these revivals of styles of furniture. Um, and where they were applying these industrial um, ways to them so they, they could create things that looked like they were handmade, but they were mass produced. Um, and one of the important things for a lot of those pieces was that um, they could also kind of have those final touches on them that they would be hand decorated in terms of being painted actually, parts of them being painted. And that was one of the roles that Alton played um, uh, in the furniture factory industry was as a, as a painter who was actually decorating works of art with a formulaic painting that would be applied again and again to a piece of furniture. So like floral motifs and things like that. Yeah, and things that he would have learned as a young artist when he was in, in Germany and he was painting murals, uh, right? And also when he came back over to Grand Rapids, he knew how to hang wallpaper. Uh, he knew how to paint homes, how to paint signs and those types of things. So I think that was, and for him, right, it was, uh, again, the idea as a young artist, that's a good thing to do because you're replicating and developing your muscle memory. Um, so you're painting something specifically over and over again. Um, so it's interesting to think of that, right, to be painting a piece of furniture many times, as different pieces of furniture with the same painting on it. And then I think of him going to Spain and painting these similar scenes 
And there's a few cases that are really interesting of where he's painted a scene of Spain, but it's from a year when he wasn't there. And I, I attribute that again to that idea that the muscle memory in him and the experience that he's had and the number of paintings he's painted of those scenes allow him to do that in the studio. Yeah, there's a, certainly an element of craft involved in that, in the big C craft, you know, that uh, craftsmanship, the idea that you, you repeat something over and over in order to master it. Yep. Yeah. Um, I wanted to kind of turn focus a little bit to this theme of immigration, right? And it's, it's clearly in the news a lot. Uh, and really, I mean, let's be honest, it's been a constant news item and debate, I think, throughout American history. Um, and, and the exhibition in terms of how it uh, was curated, you know, intentionally brings his immigration from Germany to the forefront, to the introduction of who he is as a person. Uh, and I was curious, you know, if immigration was uh, an early point, you know, for this show to focus on, or did it come later as, as it developed, you know, over time? Obviously, an exhibition like this, you're not putting it together in a couple of weeks. It's taking months, if not years, to, to put together. So I'm just curious about the timeline of, of when that became like a big, a big part of the theme. Uh, and I wonder, you know, in addition to that, kind of what is your role as a curator of, a, of an exhibition like this um, in terms of connecting these historical events and people with contemporary issues? So my background uh, is both art and history. And so one of the things that I, I wanted to apply here was, was history and casting Alton in, in the period that he was at, that he lived in, that he grew up in. And so we have a book that we published in 2016 where we have a couple of authors, that they were both faculty members at Grand Valley who approached Alton's career and, and, and applied parts of history to that. But I wanted to go a little bit further and continue to add to their scholarship with new scholarship sort of just uh, in ways in which we could talk about how Alton was a product of his time uh, and how we can learn also from his experience during that time. Um, this exhibition is probably about a year and a half in the making. Um, I, I also want to give credit. We have a, a number of students that we that that um, our collections manager and I worked with uh, probably for about six months um, to help with the research and also with uh, some of the writing and particularly with the labels. And that was exciting for us to kind of get them excited about um, learning. We are like you, an academic. We're affiliated with an academic institution, and so that was a big part of this is. Uh, allowing our students the opportunity to learn by doing. Um, immigration was on my mind from the very beginning. And I think that's part um, of my, my parents were, uh, were immigrants to Canada. I'm an immigrant to the United States. And so for me, it's, a, um, it's something that's uh, certainly affected me. And um, like, as you said, it's something that I think is on a lot of people's minds right now. But it continues to be a driving force in, in, in this country and who we are. And Alton is a perfect example, I think, of that. Uh, again, I went back to that. I started the talk in some ways with that photograph of him as a young teenager who was probably a year or so removed from being an immigrant. And for me, that's incredibly important. His experience as someone who left um, his, his, his family, his, his comfort zone behind to come to some place where he was not established is incredibly hard to do. I, and I, I wanted to honor that. And I think that's the case for many people who come to this, many people that come to this country, this country is in some ways, um, a, is, has been built by immigration. Um, you know, there, there are so many people from so many different parts of the world in this country. So immigration was there from the start. And it was something that uh, um, when we were talking with our students about um, areas of research and topics, those were things, touch points that we wanted them to look further into. Uh, the idea that um, the role of women was changing at this time, that technology was changing at this time, that uh, the, the, the urban world was changing, uh, that the progressive era was changing the ways in which we saw um, how cities were reformed. So there, were, uh, there's a lot of content that I really wanted to put in the exhibit, but I, you know, we kind of had to put the brakes on some of it because we could keep going, but. Um, it was exciting to see uh, the students kind of learn about that and uncover things and to add to what um, I'd already written. Um, and so, yeah, I, to get back to your earlier point though, immigration for me was a key touch point at the beginning. And it's a, an important, important part of the of Alton story and uh, something I think that's applicable in today's day and age too, as we see his career in life. 
It's a good time to plug the book too. So anything that isn't included in the exhibition, there's plenty more to look at and read about in, in the book itself. So, uh, and it is available in the museum shop <laughs> and on, I think on your, your uh, website too. Thanks, Jason. You're just, yeah, I mean, you're doing my job for me right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we just had a, another question uh, come up in the chat. And then uh, I had one, one last kind of thing to kind of help us wrap it up. Um, we kind of aim for these programs to be, you know, an hour-ish. And we're, we're about an hour 15 right now. So we'll start to kind of wrap things up. But I want to get to Barbara's uh, question. Um, and it, it, uh, she asks, if Alden painted uh, uh, spurred by vibrancy, uh, do you see that vibrancy expressed through his use of light or through movement of air or what other ways? So, so how do you, how do you see that vibrancy in his paintings? Uh, vibrancy in his palette. I think number one, I mentioned that earlier in the way that it changed. Um, atmosphere, I think is one of the things too. Uh, it's interesting that he painted in the Netherlands for a long period of time because the atmosphere there mimics a lot of what um, he saw on the western side of the state as well, being next to a body of water, which is cast with clouds quite a bit. Um, so I would say in terms of vibrancy, he became a big proponent of that later in his career. Uh, I've got that quote that was pulled in um, at the end of my talk there. Uh, it became a sort of a drumbeat that he sounded mid-career and towards the end of his career, the idea of vibrancy, both in which um, he was sort of celebrating that in his palette but also in the way I think that the, the sort of the atmosphere of the area that he, the places that he was painting, uh, it was sort of displayed in. So I think that would be probably my answer to that question. Great. Uh, and, and then I wanted to just kind of end things thinking about, you know, the legacy of this exhibition specifically and, and how it's being used or how it's going to be used. Um, and we both, as you mentioned, we're, we're both part of academic institutions. Um, we have, not had a lot of tours, as you can imagine right now, but we have had a couple of uh, college classes um, visit the exhibition and spend some time uh, learning uh, about, you know, modernist art and about impressionism and, and kind of American impressionism and a little bit about how Americans were always sort of behind, you know, in terms of movements for a while up until World War II. Um, so there's some historical and human humanities kinds of things that we focused on. Uh, with those courses, um, but I'm curious if you have some things to share about what's what's been going on. You mentioned GVSU students actually were involved in some of the research involved in the exhibition, but you know, has the exhibition, has the collection itself, how has that been used to uh, for a learning tool at, at GVSU? Yeah, we've we've used it. We try to use it in many different ways, and um, I mean, I think. Right, there are many unknowns moving into the next uh, few years when this exhibition is supposed to travel around the state. And so, um, you know, what are some of the outcomes for, for that? And I think um, I'm hoping many, much of the things that we, the stories that we sort of uncovered and brought to light for the exhibition will translate back into the digital holdings that we have, as well as into the gallery back at Grand Valley. Um, so I think in some ways, um, the, we're adding to scholarship here. Uh, and I think that that's an important thing. We're adding to the experience that students have in research and writing. Uh, we involve students in um, the packing of the individual objects. And so I think there was uh, opportunity for them to learn ways in which um, museum practices are applied to things. Uh, we continue to use the collection, I think, uh, to teach ways in which we understand what other humans, how other humans operate, how we can continue to develop and stress that we're, uh, we're all of one kind to, uh, empathy is a word I think that is, is becoming more and more used. And it's, I think for us, the art collection at Grand Valley speaks in ways that we can learn about each other and we can apply artwork, not just to um, students who are necessarily in art classes or in the humanities. And so I think our goal, which um, we see by having artwork in every building and available online is to reach everybody and that it's, um, that art is really, it's, it's, we want it to be accessible. We want it for, to be for everyone. We don't want necessarily have to, everyone to have to be an artist or to have an art degree to wanna talk about it and how you can apply that to different parts of your life. So I think 
if we're thinking kind of bigger picture here, um, uh, the Alton exhibition is just a small piece, I think, of what we're really doing. Um, it's an important piece right now, and I think it's something that will have a lasting effect on, um, you know, how we talk about Alton in the future and um, and the experience that people have had to interact with it. But I think long term, it's it's a uh, it's it's one of the small bricks that we're using to build um, interest and development around artwork in our community and ways in which it can be accessible to lots of people in which everyone, I think for everyone too, who comes to Grand Valley, our experience for them is that we want them to get comfortable with art, to live with it. Um, the, the, the more you are around something, the more that you're comfortable with it. And so I think that's a huge plus for us by having artwork in all our buildings um, and then encouraging people to use it in, in, in multiple ways. How can you take artwork uh, with our medical students and use it to teach um, growing empathy for someone who's becoming a doctor or nurse. We can tell by studies that uh, many people who get into that field lose concepts of feeling for other people as they're exposed more and more to dying over the years in their business. So how do you use artwork then um, earlier in their careers to teach better bedside manner and to teach greater empathy? So that's, I think, one of the ways in which, um, you know, how can we make artwork translate into many different facets of learning? Yeah, it, it's something I think we're all kind of looking at um, um, as as museums and art museums are dealing with the struggles of the current climate and figuring out how to remain uh, relevant or become relevant in some cases. Um, I know that's something that we talk about a lot at the Denos and, you know, just before you know, kinds of shutdowns happened. We had conversations with the police academy here and we did actually have a tour with the police academy students that was about, you know, just observing and looking and thinking about varying perspectives and how disagreements can happen. And, but doing it in a, in a manner, like I say, no one's gonna die, no one's gonna get hurt, it's safe. We can, we can have these conversations and learn a little bit from it. I think what strikes me about Alton's work when you talk about finding ways for non-artists to, to find, you know, find an element of it that is interesting or worth pursuing or worth researching. I, you know, I have to go back to this. It's a very kind of practical approach that he has to his, to his work, right? He, I mean, he's, he's trying to sell work to make money to support his family. Uh, and, and he's not alive, so we can't ask him today how much of that is really driving what he's doing. But I think there isn't there isn't a person on earth that isn't interested in trying to make a living to support their family right uh, whatever that means in terms of the system of government or economy that you live in everyone is is trying to do their part to support their family and i think that 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 little element you know i'm i'm thinking of all sorts of tours now that we could be doing if we had some students in the galleries to to talk about you know we we like to we like to put this mysterious cloud over artists and think about them as these unknowable creatures that are so creative, but, but the reality is there is always a practical element. There's always, how much does that canvas cost? How much do those brushes cost? You know, how much paint, how much is this paint gonna last me? How many paintings can I make with this? You know, how many can I sell, right? There's a, there is a practical quality of it that I think yeah. is ignored sometimes um, in, in, in exchange for this, oh, it's worth millions or that artist was worth millions. And, and it's like, no, think about some of these other folks that he was just getting by. And that's an interesting story to think about and to look at his art yeah. as, a, as a translation of that story. Yeah, and I would say like one of the things that happened with this exhibition in the process of, of making the exhibition and researching it and, and learning more about him is he did get more humanized for me, right? I, 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 I spent a lot more time, we spent a lot more time with him um, and so I, I gained, a, I think, in some ways, a greater, greater value for what he did and realization, like you're saying, that he was just, you know, he was a, he was a guy. He was a, he was a husband. He was a father. Uh, he was a community member. He was an artist, right? He was someone who was making a living. He enjoyed what he did. And he was, I think he was grateful to be able to do that for, for 40 plus years. Um, and, and the other thing that one thing I was kind of thinking about too, the idea that um, how current events are sort of shaping our, our idea of him too, that, that the, the, the pandemic of, of 1918, for example, it was not something I, I probably had glossed over that experience in his life many times. And in some ways I, that is our fault, right? That we have 
minimalize these different events. Now that we're in the midst of this pandemic, of course, people are looking back and saying, wow, there was a pandemic in 1918 that lasted two to three years and, you know, wiped out all these people and was worldwide. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things that got forgotten. And for me, in some ways, this was a great opportunity to say, oh, yeah, like, I'm sure he was experiencing many of the things that I'm experiencing and that we are experiencing too. Uh, you know, I, of course, I, I look at his series of still lifes and or rather um, self portraits from that period of time. And I think, yeah, you know, they are sort of formulaic, but at the same time, right, he's limited in what he can do. Uh, and like you and me, he's probably a little bit scared about what's happening in the world um, and confused and, and looking for a way to continue to just develop as an artist, maybe during a period when he's not selling as much, maybe. Absolutely. Well, I uh, I want to I want to bring us to a close at this point, and and Joel, I appreciate your time uh, today and and this evening, and in, in talking about um, Matthias Alton and and the exhibition that we have on exhibit right now. And I want to thank uh, the folks that stuck around and asked questions. And if you have more questions, you can always reach out. You know where we are, and I'm sure Joel would be happy to uh, answer anything that we wouldn't be able to. If you haven't had a chance, I would really encourage you to check out the, the catalog that is online. It's really a fun site. Even if you're just looking to kill a half hour, it's really fun to just kind of poke around, search for different kinds of themes in his artworks, uh, and learn a little more about uh, this, this great artist from West Michigan. Um, but with that, uh, we'll, we'll thank you everybody for being here. And I want to mention there will be a survey, I think, that will pop up on your screen when we close out of here. So just keep an eye on for that. Uh, it, it may also be emailed to you. I'm not sure, though, because I don't think we have your email addresses. So thanks, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>